This is the new one. The very first publisher, Zoltan, he, he was an ex-prisoner. I think this was part of the original uh, concept of getting, you know, word inside and, and uh, just because there was no literature going into uh, Canadian prisoners on specifically prisoner issues. Usually it, it's, it's pretty much all uh, prisoner, prisoner uh, submissions of art and poetry. So, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's mostly, it's their paper. In every penitentiary in this country, there should be in three discrete locations. There should be condoms, lube, and dental dam. There should be information about sexually transmitted infections, about HIV, that, all that kind of stuff. You go to one joint, and they've got that all there, three discrete locations, bam, 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 everything's good. People can access those things. You go to another one, and they don't even know what you're talking about. And I asked the healthcare coordinator, I said, oh, hey, where's the condoms? And she's like, eh, no one's using them anyways. So we didn't order them. The work that Pisan does is we're trying to make better of a really shitty situation. We're the opposite of martyrs. Like we're not into being martyrs. We're not, we don't do charity work. We don't feel sorry for our clients. Like we're about empowerment. Like that's what, that's our model and that's what we're, we're doing and we're about addressing injustice. So this isn't a pity party. One of my best friends died, uh, she was an ex-prisoner who died of AIDS and that's why I do this work. Um, her life and her son touched my life and said to me, this is really important and I need to do this. Currently, about 40% of the prison population is hepatitis C positive. That gives you a uh, horrible idea of how huge this epidemic is. Um, it's also about 10% of the population is HIV positive. I've been positive with HIV now for six years. And, um, I struggle with that. Oh yeah, I, just, I slept on benches out here when I was homeless. I slept here one time, a long time ago. I woke up, it was wet everywhere. The, the, the sprinklers were came on. <laughs> I thought it was raining, <laughs> right? <laughs> Being in prison with HIV is horrible. Um, when they did actually find out I was HIV positive, um, nobody would want to use the nail clippers or anything for that matter, like anything you did use, it was horrible. Oh, and then when I actually did explain it to the guards, well, it's your choice. It's your choice if you want to tell them. But the problem was, if I did tell them, they would all uh, discriminate me for, for being uh, HIV positive. Work specifically involving HIV positive prisoners has never been at the forefront of an AIDS agenda in Canada. It's very challenging sometimes to help people who don't do this work understand why prisoners' health is public health because people just see prisoners. If, you, if you're a prisoner, the tagline in our society says, you know, you did wrong, you do your time, and you're HIV positive, oh well, that must be something you did. Like, that's a punishment. A lot of times we don't think of prisoners' health as a human rights issue, and it is a human rights issue. When people leave jail or prison, they leave the cell counts behind, the new person comes in, they, they read them, and they, they, it's educational. It's just very odd where every, everywhere else lets it in, and a few don't. But uh, wardens are above Canadian law. They can ban uh, anything in prisons. Sometimes they say, um, oh, it's gang-related material in it. So they ban it on that, or if they think there's something offensive in a poem, they won't let it in. So it's a whole variety of reasons, but it, it seems to be excuses. They really don't like uh, the harm reduction pages, like safer tattooing and vein care. They claim that that doesn't go on inside prisons. The approach in prisons has always been zero tolerance around anything to do with sex, drugs, tattooing or piercing inside. Clearly it's not working because this is what we've been using for ever since we, it, it, we've had prisons in this. And when we look at, specifically look at that through the filter of HIV and um, hepatitis C, we look at the prevalence rates and those things are on the absolute increase inside prison. They're not going down, they're not plateauing, they're actually going up. If people are gonna do it anyways, then how do we make sure the people at least stay healthy and stay 
do are making informed choices when they're doing that. Needles were a valuable commodity back when I was using them. They never had harm reduction, and now we do. And I believe that harm reduction is saving a lot of people's lives because I doubt uh, very much that I would be HIV positive today if they had harm reduction. And not just access to clean needles and clean supplies, but uh, the education and the awareness that comes along with it. I got it through injecting a needle, which I, I usually never do. I don't like needles per se, but I was a little curious one time and I had to learn to deal with it. How am I going to deal with this and who do I talk to about this situation? When I came to Bizan, it was a lot. It was, it was so cool. I, I liked that place. And I got to learn about a lot of new things and I, I got involved with the, some like people. He's the one that does the website. Our staff are made up of people who are ex-prisoners. We also have people on staff who are HIV positive, which is really important to us because these are individuals who have been through the system, know the system, understand the complexities of the system, and really can help other people navigate their way through the system. Okay, see you later. I went to prison for an eight-year sentence. Uh, when I got out, Tom was working here and he uh, got me um, a chance to get an interview to get work here. With the reintegration support program, I work with uh, clients six months prior to release from incarceration to six months post-release, and I just try to make sure that all the things that they require to trans transition into society are in place so that it's smooth for them so that they don't end up going back into prison. We want them to be part of the community, so we isolate them from the community. We want them to be positive and constructive, so we degrade them and make them feel worthless. We want them to be nonviolent, so we put them where violence surrounds them. We want them to take care of their own lives and problems, so we ensure they totally depend on us. That is emotional. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah it's a beautiful poem. Though. You've been talking to me about this for basically since I met you. I don't think it is either, but I, I, want, I, I do take you seriously and I understand why you're concerned and I do want to check into it for you. But you, your mom gets that I don't work for corrections or the parole board or whatever, right? Okay. Because sometimes I get irate family members and they're like, why aren't you letting him out? And I'm like, I'm on his side. I don't know. I can't call him. Yeah, so they have to call me. And um, he's, this is a long standing client of mine, so he knows. If it was a new client, which I had earlier today, I would reiterate, you know, you can't just call me once and say you tried and you didn't get through. You need to keep calling, like sometimes multiple times a day, and then you'll reach me, right? Because it's impossible for me to reach them. Through word of mouth, people have learned about PASAN, and sometimes we'll get cold calls here, calls where people aren't necessarily HIV positive, but a woman wants to talk to me about maybe a persistent infection she's having, but she's not comfortable going to healthcare because she's worried about confidentiality, so she'll call us here. And the good thing is that PASAN's number um, is on what's called the PIN list, which is um, your personal identification numbers that uh, prisoners have when they're in the system. And our number is cleared, so we accept collect calls from any institution. When people are out, they can also call us as well. My children, they're always concerned, like, when I'm going to actually die away. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, because they don't really know about the health, about the, the status, about uh, an HIV virus. I'm still slowly learning. To this day, still slowly learning what the CT4 count is and what your viral load is all about. I, I'm still trying to figure out what that's all about. I think that Passan's work, it, I, think, I hope it will endure and that it will be seminal work in terms of transforming people's lives and even opening up dialogues around human rights as, prisoners' rights, sorry, as human rights and um, in, a, in a very broad systemic way. This work does not generate passion. And in fact, it breeds more resentment towards the system, more bitterness, more anger, more frustration than anything I can imagine. I'm not sure what would be happening. I'm not sure who would be picking up the slack, like if Passan didn't exist as a body where this stuff is centralized, where this information is centralized.